This time 20 years ago, Indy and Larry and his crew were just finishing up the biker build off on Discovery Channel with Mondo Porras from Denver's Choppers. To me, this was an epic matchup because Mondo was a legendary builder from San Bernardino, California, and Indy and Larry was from the East Coast from New York City. You know, Larry and Mondo were only a few months apart in age. So it was really kind of a perfect matchup and one of the best matchups there's ever been on Biker Build Off. I was there at the end of the show for the judging and when Larry got on the motorcycle to do his stunt riding for the crowd. But I wasn't there for the ride. But I thought what better way to honor this show 20 years later than to talk to the people who were there. So I talked to Mondo from Denver's Choppers. I talked to Paul Cox from Paul Cox Industries. Who worked with Larry as his right hand man at Gasoline Alley and Psycho Cycles. And I talked to Bobby Seeger Jr. Bobby was helping Larry run the shop. He was handling a lot of the business end of the thing so Larry could focus on the motorcycles, which is all he really wanted to do. You know, I remember when you came down, I was like, really wanted you to be on Biker Build Off. So I was excited when they said that you were going to do a build off with Larry because you guys are both. We're the, we were the same age. You we say, were only uh, about three or four months apart. Yeah, you guys are the same age and you're both legendary guys with like really colorful, checkered histories. Being there with Larry and being able to ride with him and, and uh, I, I thought that was one of the greatest things that I ever ever done in my life. But look back at it. How did Larry feel about you know doing the thing with Mondo? I mean, you know, um, did he did he was he ambivalent or did he you know was he excited about it? You know, um, he, overall he was excited about it, but he was also wiped out. He didn't want to do another bike show after this one. Yeah, and that would have been it. He was fed up. He was so I know Larry, you know, had just kind of got to the point. He had struggled for a lot of years, um, and it finally just got to the point to where he was focused and he was, you know, making money and saw a future for himself, right? Well, I'll tell you what I think. I think that, you know, his life had finally changed. He was growing up in some areas. He wasn't partying like he was. He started, you know, he was on the track, he was staying sober. There was no more drinking, no more dope. There was, you know, none of that. It was the, the, the hot, you know, and uh, I'll say, you know, it was heavy because having known him when he was getting high to not get high to get high again, you know, he's had that cycle. There's a little scene in there where I guess you guys came up with the idea for the chain frame. And then, mm -hmm. and then the name came from an Aretha Franklin song. It's kind of surreal. You know, we're driving through the Mojave Desert, and in this rental car with one of those stereos that I hadn't really seen that much at the time. I mean, it was 20 years ago, but it had the readout where you could see the name of the songs and stuff, like satellite radio. And he's in the passenger seat. He never liked to drive, because if he drove five minutes in a four-wheel vehicle, he would fall asleep. <laughs> so, he never liked driving cars and trucks. I just think it's a scam just to get out of drive and put his feet up on the dash and take a nap. But, you know... Um, he just, we're chatting about the project that's going to be coming up later in the year, and he gets a look, kind of like a look on his face, and he just does this cartoon, sort of like turns his head and stares at me with these big, like, saucer eyes, and he just goes, chain frame, you know, and I'm driving, and we're kind of looking back at each other, like, yeah, that's, that's cool, you know, that sounds great, and there's like, just like a moment of silence, like one beat, and the next thing you know, Chain, 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 you know, that Aretha Franklin song kicks on. Yeah. And we looked at it, we looked at each other, we're like, that's it. You know, that's got to be it. I saw that you had Erwin Graham made your frame from from, from Showtime Manufacturing from Diamond Chassis. Yes. Made your, made your, I love tremendous, it. Tremendous frame builder from, from uh, he was in uh, Riverside, California. Yeah. I loved Erwin, man. He was such a great guy. I mean, we did, you know, he made all my frames. We did a lot of business, man. And, um, Loved yeah. him. You know, just loved him. He was so solid, man. He's such a solid guy all the time. Yep. Watch Mondo fabricate these springers. I mean, that's what he mainly does for a living is made Springer front ends. And he even made the front end that was on my 2003 build-off bike against Indian Larry. And then on the 2004 build-off bike against Mike Brown. So it's really cool to watch this footage of him 
bending the steel and welding these pieces together for the bike that he was going to eventually ride against Larry in the build-off to North Carolina. Just really great footage. What do you think about, about Larry's engine, that crazy with the pan on one side and the shovel head on the other? And, uh, well, that was Larry, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> Words can't describe how beautiful this engine is in person. If you've never seen this motorcycle in person, it's just really stunning with all the engraving and the pan head and the shovel head and the two different carburetors. You know, any part, they could, you know, whether it was like the bowl off a carburetor and then put it in front of CJ and you could sit there, whittle away at it, and, you know, the body of the car, or the you know, rocker box, or the, you know, bag body, and then he'd be done with it. It would go over to Larry's bench, put it together, mount it. So it was, it was, it was wild. I mean, just you know, endless nights. Just see CJ sitting there at a folding table engraving everything we threw at him. CJ Allen died February fourth, twenty twenty two, at the age of eighty. I, I was in Vegas. My shop was in Vegas, and some of the old guys that worked at Denver Shoppers in San Bernardino, in Southern California, they came up to give me a hand. So. Uh, everybody just took a section of the bike, and I more or less oversaw it and built the front end. Built, you know, worked with everybody, designed the bike, and and before you know it, we we did it. Actually, had the bike running and done in nine days, and uh, ready to go. And when we took it on the ride, um, it didn't break down. Denver Mullins owned Denver's Choppers in San Bernardino, California. Denver was making frames and front ends for choppers. He was also into speedboat racing, and he died at the age of 48 in 1992 in a speedboat racing crash. Um, I feel like when he was building this bike, like he was create creating his masterpiece i think it's kind of how i felt uh you know he, he put his best foot forward yeah and i think that uh, this was so important to him to to do that and 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 that, you know watching uh watching him uh, you know when we're riding and and uh, and the, the him kinkering with the bike and everything else that was his crown jewel what did you think about when you saw you didn't know about the chain frame did you until you saw it uh no i didn't know about it what you think he kept, about? That, he kept that secret what'd you think about that when you saw it i i think uh uh he brought his a game and our bikes were so different and mine was from a uh, uh era gone by a, a replication of a, the digger bike and and here he comes up with something brand new and it's uh, uniquely his and his style. In this scene, Robert Pradke's talking about how everything's powder coated and he has to paint over top of powder coating, which is something he had never done. And then Paul is showing Larry the seat pan and saying how it doesn't really fit as good as he wants it to. And Larry says, it's a chain frame. It's not like it's gonna fit like a mahogany chest or something. Just give me something to sit on. And Paul says, I can't lose now. There's a scene where he's, you know, Pratt, Robert Pratt, he came in to paint. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know you guys had powder coated the frame and everything. And then Robert had to, had to paint over top of the powder. And, you know, I know you're working right. on limited time um, in a mill off. And, you know, you started racing toward the end and, all, you know, all these things need to be done. And Larry's kind of showing Robert what he wants. And at first he's kind of like, you know, I... I'm not that picky, and all of a sudden he starts just ripping out every last little detail of what he wants all over everything, and <laughs> it's pretty funny to watch. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Grease Monkey is my favorite bike, you know, of from that era, from you guys, and from him for sure. But I think most people consider. The Chain of Mystery to be kind of his masterpiece, not because it was his last bike, but um, I think that's just the way a lot of people see it. I mean, I know the Wild Child was amazing to me. I thought the Wild Child, when I saw it, I was like, oh boy, that thing's gorgeous. 
but the chain of mystery was just it seemed like it was on another level and it, it almost seemed like he knew that when he was working on it you know kind of pretty much all the sides of Larry you know his like you know clients sort of introspective side you know the, the brilliance that's behind that like sort of wacky persona and you know he's a crazy showman you know he'd love to be a showman he loved being a part of the sideshow but also he was you know kind of this savant level you know really intelligent individual that could have a conversation with somebody basically in any walk of life about whatever they do he would know some little bit piece of it so between kind of his two well known most well known bikes chain of mystery and grease monkey they sort of represented his split personality and i'm just thinking this as you're sort of throwing it out there because uh grease monkey his personal bike that really was the, you know like performance and you know perfect chopper handmade parts distilled into just the most minimal elements perfectly shaped perfectly machined uh, that you would need you know to create a motorcycle that was the whole that was the whole point you know how little do you need uh, to make this jewel that you can ride 100 miles an hour and um, and the chain of history was almost like the opposite of that but still that was the other half of his personality the showman you know with just you know every every detail it just kind of bouncing off the next and uh, too much is never enough I mean, another one of his famous you know things they would say around the shop all the time <laughs> too much is never enough i was watching him when he was it was time to start the motorcycle and I think the timing mark was on the wrong spot on the flywheel. Uh, and it was a carburetor issue. And he had this, like, mm -hmm. obsessional focus that I remember mm -hmm. from, from the build-off in 2003 that uh, you we did with you guys when we, he was mm -hmm. helping me get my bike running and tune my carburetors. Like, he had this obsessional focus that you just see him almost yeah. switch from, like you said, from being the fun, joking, happy guy to this is serious So good. Yeah. You know, he'd take his vest off, hang it in his locker, hang his keys up in it, put on his, take off his little shorty biker boots, put on his flip flops, and uh, and he was in the zone. And he would just, you know, you just see the, the information recall in his mind. And if it's not this, it's this other thing, and this is how it is. This scene is the one where I was talking about Larry having the obsessional focus, and it reminding me of the build off between he and I in 2003 where he was helping me with my carburetors. They were having a timing issue and a carburation issue with the motorcycle. The timing mark was on the wrong spot on the flywheel and it took him a while to figure that out. And, you know, it was really neat to watch how he would switch from being fun and playful to being really serious and focused to try and solve this problem that was in front of him. And it was just the way Larry was and it was what Paul was referring to earlier in his conversation. The quote that you said in the show, man, and it, I'm like, so perfect you just said we said we don't copy anybody because they were asking you about the style of your bike and and you just said we don't copy anybody and i love that man i mean like, that to me was like the standout you know yeah. four words to that show is we don't copy yeah anybody. we don't copy that. anybody we, we we're doing what we've always done mm -hmm. I'm going to go back and look, but I think he had flip-flops on. He did. He did. <clears throat> and, right? And he's the, the very first rider in the Chain of Mystery, and he's smiling like a little kid that just stole a box of candy. Yeah. Um, right here. Like, right, you know, 50 feet from where I'm sitting against the wall. And then as you're tell, talking about it, I'm like, man, that fucking, because he would be called Stupo. Like, there's a lot of nicknames for a bunch of the regular guys in the shop. I'm like, this fucking guy, he makes this over-the-top motorcycle, as happy as could be, and he's like, I'm not doing none of that. And he goes on this fucking ride, and this lady, you know, puts it in the program that he's going to be doing his standing up. Even though I wasn't in Brooklyn when Larry took the first ride on the Chain of Mystery, I know exactly how this feels. You work so hard for a week or two weeks in the shop to get this biker build-off bike done, and the first time you ride it, you have to be really thorough when you know that this bike is done and it's ready for a long road trip 
So I know how good this feels to jump on something that started from nothing, that you created from your soul and worked really hard on long days and nights, and then you get to take it out and ride it up and down the street. I, I know that smile, and uh, I, I know how Larry feels in this moment, and it's good to see him, and this is how I always remember him. You know, you think about life and how things fall into place, how puzzle pieces fall into place, and... Um, you know, you were the last one to ride with him, man. You know, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, you. That was an honor. You know, you talk to somebody that builds bikes, and maybe their motivation is the engineering. Maybe their motivation is the creativity and the aesthetics of, you know, what they get done building. Or maybe they really love riding. And that was always his core essence: was he loved riding. And. Um, I think among, among a lot of builders, you know, especially ones that did well and kind of got famous, so to speak, uh, you know, that might have been kind of rare, you know, but he just, he loved to ride. So he would get super excited, probably excited about getting on the road with the bike. Now, the, the, the bike built off with Larry, uh, it's bittersweet. Um, it was fun. It was iconic. It was a great storyline. Uh, great backgrounds for both of us. Tragic ending. You know, I mean, we had some of the best times of our lives. I mean, that ride uh, down in North Carolina and through the mountains, through, you know, West Virginia, from uh, down from New York. I mean, that was, to be, say, you know, our last ride together or his, his last ride, it was a good one. There's one clip in there where you're riding and I was like, you, you know, you're on that digger with all that rake and it's so low and you're just sticking it in the corner you know riding right next to larry you guys are side by side going through this curve on the episode and i was like hell yeah look at mondo go you know like and, you I, know, the, the bottom of my pipes are scraped almost flat what an icon you know you know i think it what made larry such a big hit not only his bikes was uh uh his 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 personality and his demeanor and his the way he looked at life, he looked at life that uh, at life like, like no other, you know. I love this little clip because whenever you're on a bike or build off, something always breaks on the road. And Larry's quote here is great. He says, what could be better? You break down in front of the welding shop. They broke down in front of Danny Crawford's shop that had a welder in West Virginia. And these folks welcomed Larry and his crew in and let him fix a broken gas tank mount on the bike. And it's kind of just... One of the amazing things about biker build off is stuff would happen on the road that you can't predict and you fix it in a way you can't predict and it creates a memory and that's what this was is something these guys got to get off the highway for a second. I'll spend some time and fix what needed to be fixed and Larry's back on the bike and back on the road and headed on his way to his biker build off victory. Driving these NASCARs on the track with Kendall and Indy and Larry and Dave Perowitz was like another dream. I mean, th it was those cars are a lot of work to drive. We really had a lot of fun out there that night. Uh, you know, you spend a, several hours learning about the track and how the car handles everything. You know, before you actually get to drive it. So getting in the car and driving it was so much fun. Unforgettable experience. I'll never ever forget it. The last day of the ride on a bike or build off is always bittersweet. You pull into whatever town the build off is going to commence in, and you, you know, get ready for the judging, and you meet everybody. There's always a lot of people there who wanted to see us ride in and see what we created, and it's always a bittersweet moment because you know it's over. You know that when this is over, you have to go back home and go back to work and go back to the real world, and we wait for weeks for it to come out on TV. But it's one of those things that. You know, um, I know Larry didn't care about winning. I know Mondo didn't care about winning. I never really cared about that. I think in the very beginning I did, and then I, I got the hang of it real quick and realized that winning or losing didn't matter. If you were on the show, you were winning. And uh, this is definitely a couple winners right here, Larry and Mondo. Larry says, I don't know why I keep up my finger on it, but I think it'd be good for me and good for the whole crew to get another wind on our belt and come off undefeated. I love watching these build offs. It brings back so many memories from 20 years ago. And this is a really great episode. There's so many good moments in this episode, but I don't like the ending of it. 
So I'm not going to say anything about the ending of it. I'm not going to show you the ending of it. I'm just going to leave it at the point where the video cuts off. And I think everybody knows what happened in the end.